So again, this is uh, the seventh in a series of Salt and Sea webinars. Uh, here's a list of the previous six Salt and Sea webinars. All of these are available, uh, and this webinar itself will also be available uh, at this website shown below. So here's our uh, agenda. We're going to hear first from Dr. Ryan Sinclair, who will moderate the panel, and then we'll introduce the other panelists. Um, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Ryan, who I've known for many years. He's an associate professor of environmental microbiology in the Loma Linda University School of Public Health and the Department of Earth and Biological Sciences. He completed his PhD on water quality from Tulane University and has a postdoc in environmental microbiology from the University of Arizona. He has been working on exposure science questions around water and air challenges in the Eastern Coachella Valley for the last 10 years. Ryan? All right. Hi, everybody. I, it's my pleasure to, to moderate this panel and introduce to you some, some folks who have been also working in the ECV in the Eastern Coachella Valley and in the Imperial County areas of the communities around the Salton Sea. Um, that have done some really great work, both community members and academics and people who are both academics and community members. Um, so with all of that, I'd, I'd like to start just to talk you through some of the general subjects and issues around public health and the salt and sea, and then um, get into the specifics with our with our panelists. So what I've done is have a a story map and um, an ArcGIS story map, that is. And these are uh, kind of a way to show a map as well as um, as well as well um, some data and questions. It's kind of like a presentation, but it's also a map. So I compose this to sort of emphasize overall what's going on with the Salton Sea. So this is the, the shoreline level at about 2018, and that's right before the quantitative, uh, quantitative um, settlement agreement uh, mitigation water was shut off. And that at that point, the Salton Sea is now, the shoreline has receded much more, but this is the, the shoreline as of 2018, and then it, it's changed um, dramatically since then. Um, before we even get into the Salton Sea or the health, I think it's really important to give um, some numbers to the situation here. Whenever we see these pictures in popular media or we see these pictures of the Salton Sea and maybe Bombay Beach or some kind of wasteland, the post-apocalyptic wasteland, um, you know, it presents kind of a negative picture and does a disservice for the communities that are living there. In total, there's close to 600,000 or maybe more people that live within 20 miles of the Salton Sea. And um, the census data from 2010 is up to 561,000. So I'm pretty sure there's there's more than 600,000 at this point. Um, and, you know, the Salton Sea has several vibrant and diverse communities around it. And that's something to really start with before we even get into the health component. Because as thinking about the Salton Sea, we always think about this picture of this desolate lake, desert lake, saline lake. Um, so there are some tools out there to look at health and vulnerability around the Salton Sea. And there's federal tools as well as um, some other um, state tools. The California um, OEHA, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, they have the Cal Enviro screen, and that looks at um, pollution, like contaminants in the environment, as well as uh, population characteristics. And it shows some vulnerability around the Salton Sea of the populations there, but it doesn't quite get the, the main um, issues going on there. And that's the, the Cal Enviro screen. Um, the reason is because urban communities will often um, place a lot of pressure on these kinds of, of metrics. So in order to really find out what's going on there at the Salton Sea, there needs to be some studies. Here's another, um, this one is the, um, the US, the CDC's SVI, the Social Vulnerability Index. This one gets at it a little bit more, but interestingly, um, it actually doesn't have any measures of environmental contaminants. It's just looking at um, health uh, or household characteristics and housing type and 
uh, racial and ethnic minority status, but there's actually no environmental um, metrics here, but it does show the vulnerability around the salt and sea a little bit better than the other one. So that's why we, we really need to start getting into um, uh, local solutions to start um, collecting data. Um, this is a website that I embedded in this story map, and this is actually our um, community science project that we're working on, where we include locals to go out and collect data about the Salton Sea on a boat. We go out every two months or so and collect nutrients and uh, water quality to measure nutrients and microbes. Um, but overall, you know, to solve the health problems in the Salton Sea, you really need a couple of things. First of all, you need better data and then you need action and advocacy, and then you need policy. And all of those things have to start with organized efforts on the ground from government representatives um, in healthcare districts and air districts to um, academics. But um, uh, the funny thing about the academics role is that in order for these changes to, to get going in the right way around the Salton Sea is that the community really has to lead the academics. So academics may have certain skill sets, but it really has to be the community that's that's kind of leading the research questions and leading the projects. And that's something that I've advocated for. Um, there's plenty to talk about here, and I'm not gonna take too much time, more time about that. I did wanna show you just a couple of tidbits on data that um, is out there already. You know, our project with the um, the Alianza, formerly the uh, Building Healthy Communities, um, we had a study of more than 1,500 adults. Um, and in our study, we saw asthma prevalence pretty high in, um, in Coachella City and in children in North Shore. So if you look at these orange bars here, um, we saw some pretty high asthma prevalence there from that. And that was our, our study. We have a lot more data to describe that, but um, it, it does show you that there is some high asthma there. And then another one that has just kind of reviewed data more recently is uh, Yanning Miao from UCR with her advisor, Will Porter, um, had worked on this paper to look at the association of PM 2.5 to um, hospital emergency room uh, visits. And that was kind of interesting um, as well. And then um, there's other studies as well. You know, Dr. Cheney is working on one. And of course, the work by uh, um, USC and, um, and their important work in the Imperial County, that was a really good um, prevalence survey to look at asthma um, reported by parents of elementary school children. So those are some studies out there. But overall, considering how many people live there and considering how big the problem is in the Salton Sea, there's a real data disparity going on here. And um, that, that, that means that we need more effort on this and advocacy. Um, one of the things I also wanted to bring up is there is this uh, assembly bill now um, introduced by um, uh, Eduardo Garcia, and this is to um, start a, a comprehensive health study. I've interacted with their office a little bit. My, my thing with the comprehensive health studies is that it has to include a long-term cohort. If you want to measure association and just say this environmental contaminant is associated with this you know, um, health issue, then you can do that with a cross-sectional. But what we really need is funding from the state to do a long-term cohort study, because with that, you can actually get to causation. And that's what we really need from this area to make true policy change. Before I, you know, I, I can talk a lot more about this, but I really wanted to introduce our panelists. So I'm going to introduce them because they all have very uh, specific and interesting updates to everything I've said. And I wanted to just um, start off with that first. So we're gonna start with, um, with Dr. Farzan and she is an associate professor of population and public health in the USC School of Medicine. She has several awards and federal funding through the NIHS, the National, National uh, Cancer Institute and other sources to work on these health equity and environmental justice 
questions. I first learned about her with her work in LA where they did this really cool story map of um, air beam. They used air quality and the um, monitors and they walked around in LA. And then I was kind of interested to see that she's working in Imperial as well. So um, she's leading up this children's airy project. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, send it off to her. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to uh, organize my screen here. <laughs> it seemed to have uh, uh, shut something down. Uh, it looks good. Okay, great. Um, great. Thank you all so much for um, being here. I'm really I'm pleased to present our work that I co-lead with uh, Dr. Jill Johnston here at the University of Southern California and in partnership with Comité Civico del Valle in Imperial, as well as our partners at University of Washington and the um, Public Health Institute. So I'll be focusing on our children's health study, um, assessing Imperial Valley respiratory health and the environment today. So um, these images here are probably no surprise to anybody. Um, this is a, an aerial view of the Salton Sea over the last um, several decades. And while you can see that the sea is receding, um, you can really see dramatic effects after the QSA goes into effect after 2018. And so um, we're seeing more and more playa being revealed um, over time. And um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm can you still see my slides? Are they okay? Um, I'm having an issue here. Um, yeah, I can. I can see them now. It's back to the edit view. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. Um, if this is okay, um, I, I'm going to just show it like this. Um, I apologize. I'm having some issues with. Um, you click on the, the icon next to the slider in the lower right. Right there. Yeah. Um, I'm just um, I'm losing my my notes are closing out as I'm going. Oh, through. So um, I'm really sorry. Um, apologies. And I will try to make this as big as I can so you can all see. Um, great. Sorry about this. Technical difficulties, of course. Um, great. OK, sorry for this. Um, and so, as I was saying, as the sea shrinks, we're seeing more and more of this playa being exposed, um, which we're really concerned about blowing into the air as dust and impacting air quality. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. So sorry. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay. Um, apologies. Um, so as the sea shrinks, we're really concerned about this increase in windblown dust and dust events and how this may affect children's health, particularly. We know that the playa dust um, can carry numerous contaminants, um, which the sea has been fed by runoff, agricultural runoff um, from the New and Alamo rivers for many decades, which can carry um, contaminants from agriculture like pesticides, heavy metals, um, and other things that may have settled into this soil over time, and as it's revealed, um, can be then mobilized into the air um, and then inhaled, which can then impact respiratory health and uh, ultimately quality of life as well. Um, so among um, among many issues in the um, region of the Imperial um, County, the Salton Sea is just one. And so we know that there are a number of factors that can impact air quality. Um, so for example, diesel from trucks or agricultural burning, in addition to the potential contribution of dust from the Salton Sea can impact air quality um, and be risk factors for respiratory health conditions. And we know that poor air quality may exacerbate conditions like asthma, um, which is then um, supported by the fact that the Imperial County has um, the greatest number of emergency room visits um, of anywhere in California uh, for asthma related conditions. And so um, 
in light of all these concerns around um, the contribution of dust from the salt sea and the community's concerns around respiratory health, um, we decided to um, work with uh, Comité Civico to develop this study around the effects of um, windblown dust from the receding shoreline and how this may impact public health, uh, particularly for children. And so this was the impetus for the Children's Eye Day study. So the objectives of our study um, were to um, work with schools in uh, primarily around the northern area um, of Imperial Valley. Um, so we enrolled a cohort of um, over 500 children from Imperial Valley to assess respiratory health. And so working with Comité and uh, parents and school officials, we developed a study to examine um, exposures to particulate matter in the region, as well as other air pollutants, and then also assess respiratory health um, among these children. So we began this study in 2017 and have been collecting data ever since. Um, we ended our uh, last round of data collection last spring. And so now we're beginning to analyze these data and the ultimate goal is to really use these data to um, inform public health actions. A major component of our work is assessing air quality, which we do in a number of different ways. Um, we've been fortunate enough to work with Comité Civico, um, which has implemented and maintains um, this um, community air monitoring network called IVAN. You can see the blue dots on the map on the left. And this allows us to look at um, very um, localized uh, concentrations of particulate matter in addition to federal monitors. We also collect samples of particulate matter using this uh, setup on the left, which is um, a series of pumps. And um, it allows us to pull air through onto filters and then um, analyze samples of uh, these integrated particulate matter samples for their composition. Then that allows us to get a picture of where the dust is coming from at these different locations where we have these monitors at uh, five of our schools. We um, assess children's health in a few different ways. Since 2017, we've been conducting health surveys. Um, these are conducted twice yearly, both spring and fall. And we ask parents to report respiratory health symptoms as well as other demographic and lifestyle information. Um, starting as the children got a little bit older, we also asked the children to report some of their own symptoms as well. And so we have a, um, a rich uh, data set of a number of different respiratory health conditions. We also measure um, several things in an in-person visit at each of these surveys. Um, so one of them is uh, spirometry, which measures lung size and function, as well as height, weight, and blood pressure. So just to give you a, a sense of um, who's participated in our study, um, to date, we have had 744 children participate. 94% of them um, identify as uh, Latina. Um, about half, a little more than half are females and uh, about three quarters have public health insurance. And um, few report living with a smoker, which is great, um, but about 14% report having a biological mother with asthma, which is a risk factor for asthma. And so as uh, Ryan alluded to, we've done um, some work to look at the prevalence of respiratory symptoms in our cohort. Um, so these are symptoms at baseline. Um, and so what we see is there, there are relatively high, um, uh, relatively high prevalence rates for a number of respiratory conditions. Allergies lead the way with about 41% of children overall reporting um, allergies. About 32% report having had wheezing in their lifetime. And 21%, about one in five, um, report having doctor diagnosed asthma. Um, what I'm not showing you here is that there are a number of children, um, when we split uh, our sample into asthmatics versus non-asthmatics, we do see that um, the non-asthmatic children do have relatively high rates of some of these respiratory health issues as well, um, which may indicate that uh, there is um, some underlying um, conditions or um, undiagnosed asthma in our community. And so, just to summarize this a bit, we see asthma prevalence in IDA participants that is more than two times greater than the overall US average. Um, 
one in six children in our study has reduced lung function. And as you see there, there are a number of children that reported allergies, wheezing, um, currently taking asthma medication. Um, and as I mentioned, there are a number of um, people that report um, symptoms, even among non asthmatics. We've begun linking this um, respiratory health data to a number of environmental variables as well. Um, and particulate matter is of great interest to us because um, this is what we'll be looking at both from the sea as well as ambient levels, which may be from other sources. But what we see is that particulate matter is associated with greater wheezing among IDA children. And so for um, each standard deviation increase in PM2.5, we observe about 5% more wheezing among asthmatic children, but still about 3% more wheezing among non-asthmatic children with a small increase in uh, PM2.5. We also see similar trends for coarse particulate matter PM10. And while we're primarily concerned with um, particulate matter that may be um, coming from the salt and sea, we're also looking at other sources of um, particulate matter exposure. And one of these is um, agricultural burning. This is a relatively under-recognized, understudied source of air pollution in rural uh, communities. And it's um, relatively common uh, practice in Imperial to burn um, crop waste after a harvest. And since fields are turned over very rapidly, um, this is an efficient way to clear the fields after um, crops have been um, harvested before replanting. But this releases a number of air toxics, particulate matter, um, and other air pollutants. And what we do see is that children who live near agricultural burning are more likely to experience some of these respiratory symptoms like um, wheezing um, or bronchitic symptoms, which includes dry cough and phlegm, um, than those live further away from burning. About two out of three children in our cohort live close to agricultural burning. Um, and among the asthmatics who live near agricultural burning, these are children that are more likely to have to use asthma control medications. Um, before I end, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the work from parents' perspective. We um, have assessed parental stress in some of our surveys, and more than a quarter of our parents reported that they were often stressed. Um, and the number of concerns that were um, most common were parental concerns, um, family concerns, and socioeconomic. But one of the things that really stood out to us was that 14% uh, of parents of asthmatic children said that they regularly felt helpless when their child experienced these type of breathing issues. And so not only um, are these you know, respiratory issues affecting children's health, um, they are also impacting the well being of parents as well. And so um, we see these high rates of asthma and respiratory symptoms among children in Imperial Valley. And um, we're seeing that not only is particulate matter, but also agricultural burning. These exposures are both associated with adverse effects on children's respiratory health. Um, we're hoping to show some studies of the dust composition and how different sources of particulate matter impact aspects of respiratory health. And these analyses are underway, unfortunately, um, somewhat delayed due to uh, the pandemic and laboratory shutdowns. But as we begin analyzing all of these data, um, we are trying to understand um, what the community really wants and needs in order to develop a framework for community action, which will be in partnership with uh, community stakeholders and our community partners at Comité. And so the real goal is to use this study data to put it to work to support health protective policies in both schools and at local level to um, to help mitigate some of these effects on children's health. And we're also disseminating information to parents and schools and community members um, so that they can see all of the data that they've contributed to. And um, so with that, I thank all of my collaborators, particularly um, our partners at Comité, uh, funding from NIEHS. And um, thank you and apologies again for the technical difficulties.
Hey, thanks so much, Dr. Farzan. That was great. Um, it's so nice to hear about all the work that you're doing to tie together um, the contaminants and the health and then really focusing on a certain uh, region. So um, with that, our, our next presenter is, um, is Alejandro and he, Alejandro Espinoza, and he is, um, he has an MPH and he's the chief of community engagement for the Desert Healthcare District and uh, slash foundation. And he's also a faculty member at the California State University Fullerton. Um, he used to direct the Latino Health Access um, and collaborate uh, nationwide with community-based organizations to design and implement community health worker programs. He's really, a, he's an ECB resident at heart, and he's really there um, at the healthcare district, always thinking about the ECB and always contributing to committees and governing boards with the mind on um, people that live um, in the Eastern Coachella Valley. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alejandro. Thank you, Ryan. Um, absolutely right. Yeah, I, you know, I grew up in the ECV, you know, I have plenty of family that, that lives there in, in, in Coachella and, and Mecca. So, you know, I'm, the ECV is very near and dear to my heart, but great presentation, um, you know, from Dr. Farzan. And I think we'll build upon some of that information. Um, so let me share my screen here. Um, there we go. So what we wanted to look at and um, with the Desert Healthcare District, wanted to, to first is um, talk about who we are as a Desert Healthcare District. So uh, the Desert Healthcare District is a special district that was established in 1942. Um, as a hospital district, we own but do not operate a Desert Regional Medical Center. Now we focus more on public health and philanthropic efforts here throughout the Coachella Valley. Um, our mission is to achieve optimal health at all stages for all district residents, and the vision is connecting Coachella Valley residents uh, to health and wellness um, uh, services and programs through philanthropy and resources, health facilities, information, and community education and public policy. And as you can see that the map, we um, our district encompasses all of the Coachella Valley. Um, so we have um, a vested interest in looking at what is happening with the Salton Sea and the possible impacts of the salt and sea and other potential factors that are impacting respiratory health and other possible other health conditions for our district residents. So with that in mind, you know, we reached out to um, Paul English and um, several other members of Tracking California um, for them to do a, a, a comprehensive study of what is happening um, in regards to hospitalization rates due to um, air quality and other potential environmental health factors and compare um, the eastern part of the Coachella Valley and the, and the western part of the Coachella Valley and see exactly what is happening there. So we were able to, to gather really good data, um, which I'll be sharing here in the next couple of slides. So we were looking at, you know, the differences of poverty rates and um, hospitalization rates and emergency um, department visits between Eastern Coachella Valley residents and Western uh, Coachella Valley residents. So with that, I just want to paint a picture of the, de the different demographic characteristics of the two um, sides of the Coachella Valley. So as we, we can look at here in this slide is um, the first column, we had the zip codes with lower poverty rates of less than 20%, which we see that the more affluent areas, um, you know, your Palm Desert, your La Quinta, Indian Wells, uh, Rancho Mirage, um, certain parts of Cathedral City and Palm Springs. And then on the on the second column there, we could look at um, you know residents um, that have a, a, a higher poverty rate, which is higher than twenty percent. And we're looking at you know the majority of the eastern part of the Coachella Valley, starting um, in certain parts of Indio, all the way down to the North Shore, um, Imperial County. Um, border. So some of these rates we wanted to look at and, and see exactly what is the differences between these two valleys. Um, so here we have a, a graphic representation of what that looks like. So here, as you can see, um, you know, not only um, are we looking at poverty rates in the eastern part of the Coachella Valley, but we're also looking at certain communities um, beyond the 10 freeway on, on the northern part that reach all the way out to Desert Hot Springs which we know also has some other environmental health issues there with 
the Sentinel power plant that was built, um, you know, some uh, quite a while ago. And there's other factors there that that contribute to poor air quality in, in those regions. So I just wanted to show this graphic representation of what we're looking at between higher and lower poverty rates in the eastern part of the Coachella Valley and the western part of the Coachella Valley, which is going to set up the rest of my conversation and some of the data that I'll be sharing with everybody here today. So the first thing that we wanted to do is look at age-adjusted emergency department visits um, for lower and higher poverty zip codes in the Coachella Valley. So as you can see there, um, the lower um, poverty um, rates are represented by the blue columns and the higher poverty are in the orange. And we wanted to look at asthma, COPD, bronchitis, pneumonia, heart disease, and myocardial infraction. So we wanted to look at why community or how many community members were actually admitted or visited the emergency department within all of these different um, diseases. And as we can see here, there are very stark differences between the lower poverty and the higher poverty areas. Um, in regards to asthma, we can see there's almost, you know, um, a 6%, you know, increase from, from the uh, lower poverty to the higher poverty. And same thing with COPD, bronchitis, pneumonia, heart disease, and myocardial infraction. But one point that I want to make here is that a lot of these um, figures, especially with the higher poverty areas, they might be a little bit deceiving because I, I, I would imagine, you know, some of these numbers are underreported because, you know, the either the individual is not properly diagnosed as having one of these res respiratory diseases. And some of these numbers might actually be a little bit higher in the higher poverty area. So that is one point that I wanted to make. And as you can see there in the red text in the bottom that we do have higher poverty areas have higher rates of asthma, COPD, pneumonia, heart disease, and myocardial infection. Um, so this is what we wanted to look at. What is the differences between East Valley and West Valley? And this is, the data is showing that there is a stark differences between those two uh, communities. So this was emergency department visits. We also wanted to look at hospitalization rates. And once again, we're able to see the very stark differences between lower poverty areas and the higher poverty areas here within the Coachella Valley in regards to hospitalization rates. Once again, we were looking at asthma, COPD, bronchitis, pneumonia, heart disease, and myocardial infraction. So once again, we see the data is represented that there is a very stark difference from East Valley to West Valley. And what does the East Valley obviously have that the West Valley really doesn't have to deal with is the proximity to the, to the Salton Sea. So that is one of the connections that we wanted to make is what are those environmental health factors that these lower poverty communities are dealing with that the higher poverty communities are not dealing with. Um, so we wanted to have this data represent, you know, those differences and show us that there is a huge difference between these two different communities. And for us to have that data, to work with community partners, to start addressing, um, you know, some of, some of the factors that are contributing to these very, um, to these higher rates, and hopefully start mitigating some of the health impacts derived from the Salton Sea and other potential environmental health factors within the, um, within the Salton Sea. So another, another thing that we looked at um, was the youth illness rates for um, youth under 17 years old. Um, so among 17, uh, youth among 17 years of age or younger, there were more emergency department visits for asthma in higher poverty areas and compared with lower poverty areas. Um, so we're looking at maybe 56 versus 1,000 residents in comparison to 48 versus 1,000 district residents respectively. And once again, I wanna make the point that we feel that these numbers are underrepresented because you know, um, district residents in lower poverty areas tend to not be diagnosed with these respiratory health issues because they typically you know, show up to the emergency department with some kind of respiratory um, condition or they're having uh, trouble breathing. So we wanted to look at that. So we know that these numbers are underrepresented. They might be a little bit close in this graphic representation, but we know that those numbers would definitely be higher if we take into account those um, district residents that have not been di properly diagnosed 
by their physicians and noted in their health records. Um, same thing with pneumonia. Um, you know, we had higher hospitalization rates in higher poverty area versus lower poverty. We were looking at 14 and, and 10,000 district residents versus 10 um, and 10,000 uh, district residents. So once again, very stark differences from one end of the valley to the other. Um, so we don't. We also want to make an analysis, and Tracking California did a very great job of not only looking at, you know, poverty rates, but we also wanted to to look into the different, um, you know, poverty um, illness rates and and comparing and comparison of the two sexes in low and high poverty areas. So an age adjusted um, department emergency department visits for ten thousand and higher poverty zip codes in the Coachella Valley by sex, now we start looking at very uh, very stark differences from males to females and certain diseases. So with females, we, we found that there are higher rates of asthma, COPD, and bronchitis, where males had higher rates of heart disease and myocardial infarction. So we wanted to, once again, not only look at poverty, but also the differences between the sexes. And as we can see here, depending on the sex, there are very unique um, health conditions associated which each of the two sexes. Uh, same thing with hospitalization rates. Um, once again, we were looking at male versus female in higher poverty zip codes in, in the Coachella Valley. And females had a higher rates of COPD um, and males have had a higher rates of heart disease and myocardial infarction. Um, so this is once again, a visual representation of the stark differences now in poverty areas, but now looking at differences between the two sexes. So some of the conclusions from the patient encounter data that Tracking California um, provided us when, when we commissioned this study um, is that we found that there were obvious disparities by poverty, sex, and among youth and respiratory and cardiovascular disease um, in the Coachella Valley. Emergency department visits and hospitalizations you know, may indicate some other serious diseases that might be um, not diagnosed. And that's one of the biggest concerns for us as a desert healthcare district is the number of folks that might, you know, be that are not diagnosed for certain respiratory conditions or diseases here in, in, in the eastern part of the Coachella Valley. Um, so some of the next steps for this kind of work that, that we want to continue to to move forward is to conduct the sample survey of this condition, including some of the symptoms associated with some of these respiratory health issues and develop projects to address the disparities and mitigate the impact of poor air quality on health. And we're already doing some of that work with partners um, like Alianza, where we're doing um, an air quality academy with um, community residents, where we're doing, um, where we're installing um, air sensors, air quality sensors in homes of 15 and, uh, community members so we could get hyper-localized data um, at the neighborhood level, not in just common areas throughout the community, but now we're, we're, we'll be able to get community level data. So we are getting um, you know, that, that data from, you know, from these community members that um, have installed these, these air sensors in, in their homes. And then we're also working with the school districts to ensure that they're also um, you know, uh, looking at data when there's a, a poor air quality days and protect the students, maybe not allowing them to do any kind of extracurricular activities outdoors um, and be looking at the data, be looking at the air quality index for them to get that information and hopefully, you know, proactively make some of those decisions to either send the students home or keep them indoors because of the poor air quality um, that they might be exposed to outdoors. And then lastly, um, what we want to continue to do is to screen Eastern Coachella Valley students and, res um, and, and residents for respiratory diseases. So we could get really, um, uh, so we could get better data than the one that we currently have. Because I mentioned previously, we feel that you know, some of these conditions are underreported because our district residents have not been properly screened or diagnosed for, for some of these respiratory health issues. Um, and then the conclusion from the air quality analysis that, that was done by the Berkeley Air Group is that we want to continue to, to um, you know, to work, you know, to monitor. And I, as I mentioned, we are working with the South Coast Air Quality Management District on this project to install uh, more sensors at the community level. And we're open to partnerships to see exactly how we as a healthcare district 
you know, could help improve the air quality, mitigate the impact of, of air quality or poor air quality um, that will have an impact on the health, or the health of our district residents. That is valuable for us. We know that the salt and sea is, is a, it's a huge problem and us as a healthcare district are not gonna solve the issue of the salt and sea, but we want to do is work with community partners, work with researchers to start, you know, getting, you know, better data and with that data, have that data guide us towards, you know, implementing, designing, um, you know, projects, interventions to ensure that, you know, we are, you know, helping those Eastern Coachella Valley residents that are being exposed to this very poor air quality. So with that, I believe, just wanted to acknowledge um, our partners at Track in California, um, who are the lead authors of, of this report that we commissioned and also from the Berkeley um, Air Group that did the air quality analysis for, for our report. Thank you, Alejandra, that was great. And it's so nice to hear from the district starting to do the research or already having done a lot of research in, um, in the area. Um, it's refreshing to hear that. Um, the next presenter is Dr. Cheney, uh, Dr. Ann Cheney. She's a medical anthropologist and associate professor in the UCR Department of Social Medicine, Population and Public Health. She's the founder of the Hispanic and Bilingual Ambulatory Medical Studies Program, and she's um, a faculty supervisor for the Coachella Valley Free Clinic that the UCR um, coordinates. She, she leads several different projects in the ECV, but she also, I was just reading that she's also a outstanding mentor of the year at UCR. She had that award as well. Um, I'm not surprised. I mean, she does great in the community and has a lot of rapport and people love working with her. So with that, I'll, um, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Anne. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sinclair, for the very thoughtful introduction. Um, so I'm happy to be here and to share some of the work that we are doing. And the talk, or the title of uh, the talk today is Salt and Sea Environment in Child Health. And so I uh, will talk a lot about the environment and how caregivers perceive that environment to affect the health and well being of their children. So, in addition to the um, different roles that Dr. Sinclair mentioned, I also in collaboration with our community partner and community members have um, created a collaborative that we refer to as Unidas por Salud. And Unidas por Salud is aimed at our mission is to build the capacity of students and community health workers to partner in research, healthcare service delivery and public health outreach, specific in, specifically in the rural desert region of inland Southern California. Our work is focused in the Eastern Coachella Valley, so the Eastern part of River, Riverside County and the Northern part of the sea. Primarily um, the communities of North Shore, Oasis, Thermal, Mecca, and then also Sultan City. And I include this map on here to illustrate the connection that we have between the Eastern Coachella Valley and Mexico. The majority of individuals living along or in the Eastern Coachella Valley along the Northern part of the sea have origins and ties to Mexico. And I include specifically here Michoacan because this is where the largest community of Purepecha um, in the Eastern Valley are from, the state of Michoacan. Ochumicho specifically, which is um, um, a community in Michoacan that is a Purepecha community. So we, Collaborate with Conchita uh, Maria Posar, and her organization is Conchita Servicios de la Comunidad. This is a woman and minority owned organization, and the mission is to empower indigenous and minority women to develop skills and the capacity to address the health needs of underserved and vulnerable immigrant communities. Um, while we focus in the Eastern Coachella Valley, we collaborate with other investigators at different universities. For example, we have collaborations um, with investigators at UCLA and also through some of the COVID-19 work that we've been doing throughout the state of California. We have collaborations and then um, we have started to do work in the Western part of the Valley with Latino communities. So Conchita Servicios de la Comunidad supervises a team of community health workers with expertise in human subjects research, 
ethics and research, recruitment, qualitative data collection and analysis, survey administration, and healthcare, healthcare services engagement. And something that we are now um, just entering into, well, not just, I guess it's been um, about a year, is randomized controlled trials. And so we currently um, are uh, leading a randomized controlled trial at the moment in which our promotores, community health workers, play a critical role and engaging members of communities all along the Sultan Sea. The focus is not on childhood asthma, it's on infant feeding and nutrition, but I share this project just to illustrate the depth that our team members have. And the role that our promotores play is very unique and different from many organizations when we think about um, the role of promotores or community health workers, because they focus on research. And so their expertise is really in um, engaging vulnerable members of their community into research, which means that his, historically marginalized populations that have often not been successfully engaged into research, we're able to engage them because we have leadership within the community from members of the community who are the trusted individuals that community members look up to. And so the work that I'll be talking about is all about how we um, build the capacity of individuals who you see here on this screen um, to be able to do the research. So our community, as I mentioned, is communities along the northern part of the Sultan Sea, specifically the Eastern Coachella Valley. And as we talked about, um, the Sultan Sea originally occupies or uh, occupies the original prehistoric Kauia lake bed. And so if we take a look at this image, there's a whole history that we often don't talk about when we think about the Salton Sea. Um, and that history is really important because it, it illustrates the manipulation of this environment. And primarily it's the manipulation of the environment because of agricultural purposes. And um, what we know is that agricultural runoff has been and continues to be the primary source of water, which contributes to high salinity. And so then we have to really think about who lives along the borders of this sea, this shrinking sea, as many of my colleagues have commented on, um, the sea in which, because it's shrinking, those living along the seas are increasingly exposed to toxic dust. So the population living along the borders of the sea is primarily Latinos and indigenous Mexicans who live and work in the nearby, uh, who live along the sea and work in the nearby agricultural lands. And there's a very large community of Prepecha, as I mentioned earlier. Some more recent estimates suggest that anywhere from six to 10,000 members of the Prepecha community live along the borders of the sea. So my community collaborator often refers to um, La Danza de los Viejitos, which is the, the dance of the old people. Um, to talk about the size of the population, the Puerto community in the Eastern Valley, and that this dance is really important in terms of um, community representation. And often she talks about how the dance that's put on in the Eastern Valley is one of the larger dances in the US, which suggests that in the Eastern Coachella Valley, that is the population that's likely the, the largest community, um, sorry, not population, but the largest community of Puerto in the US. So our work recently has focused on childhood asthma. And I should just say, I'm a, I'm a community engaged researcher, um, which means that I do not necessarily hold expertise in childhood asthma, but childhood asthma is a need of the community. And so over time, our team has developed expertise in childhood asthma. So what we know um, as one of our colleagues on this webinar presented, we know that childhood asthma along the Salton Sea, it's about 20 to 24, or I'm sorry, 22% of children living along the sea suffer from asthma. And that's about twice as high as the state and national average. So it's really quite an important um, chronic illness for us as investigators, for us as public health practitioners and concerned community members to understand. And this is an image from one of our projects, our photo voice project. This is um, a, a participant's daughter who suffers from asthma. So our work over the years, we began our partnership Unidos por Salud in 2017, 2018. 
And we began doing asthma work in 2018. We began with surveys with caregivers of children with asthma. Our focus has always been with caregivers and eliciting their understanding and perceptions of how the sea affects the health and well-being of their children or the, the Salton Sea environment. Um, so we received funding from NIH and IMHD to continue our work. And over the past several years, we've been focusing on doing qualitative research in 20 to 2020 to 2021, we conducted focus groups and interviews of caregivers of children with asthma. And then in 2021 to 2022, we partnered with um, Dr. Will Porter at UCR to combine photo voice, which is a participatory action research method in which uh, photography is used in narrative texts. The photography is used to symbolize participants' responses to um, research questions. And we combined those data with air quality data. And then now our work is focusing very much on moving into the health services and clinical realm. And so we have a patient centered outcome research institute award, which is a capacity building award to build the capacity of caregivers, community health workers and healthcare providers to partner in clinical research. So I've talked a little bit about the kind of work we do in the sense that the voice of the community drives our work and we are very much focused on capacity building. So this image here illustrates the different levels of engagement of community in the research process. And when we think about traditional models of research, they're, they're representative of the description on the, the, my left-hand side. So researchers inform community of the project and they, may, they might solicit feedback from them. So there's a big might. Often traditional models of research um, are referred, traditional models of research and researchers are referred to helicopter researchers. So the idea where the, the um, academic or the investigator holds the expertise, asks the research questions, and then engages the community with the expectation to extract data. And this is historically what has happened in the Eastern Coachella Valley. The next is the idea of um, a more mutual communication flow between different stakeholders, so between community and academics. And then the next is community participates actively in different aspects of the project. So this could be recruitment, for instance, or maybe dissemination of research findings. And the next, as we go along the spectrum, community and researchers collaborate on every aspect of the project, including shared decision-making and ownership. This is the type of research that we engage in. We try as much as we possibly can to have decision, shared decision-making and ownership. And this is where we're moving. Community leads and owns the project with collaboration for researchers. And in many ways, our randomized controlled trial reflects the community leads and owns the project. So here's an illustration of some of the promotores that have worked with us in the Eastern Coachella Valley for our work on childhood asthma. Um, this is part of a, a zine that we created in collaboration with the Youth Leadership Institute, but you can see we highlight the experiences of the promotores in recruiting um, historically marginalized communities in research focused on children's health. So the Salton Sea environment. This is what we've learned over the years. Um, caregivers describe it primarily using three key categories or images. Um, their children are exposed to toxic smells, dust storms. This image here is an illustration of, it's a mat with um, sand, dust, that is just accumulated um, during a dust storm. And then continuous fires. And yes, they might be agricultural, um, burns, but they're also um, burning of different uh, waste and, and trash, essentially, that often occurs on tribal lands. So how does this environment then, the Salton Sea environment, affect children and their health? When we talk to caregivers, what they consistently tell us is about the chronic health conditions that their children have. So asthma is only one of the chronic conditions. When we engage caregivers, we recruit using eligibility criteria that their children must have either a diagnosis of asthma or be prescribed asthmatic or 
medication for asthma symptoms. And what we notice is a lot of children are not diagnosed with asthma. And this reflects some of the things that my colleagues have commented on. Um, there's high utilization of emergency room care. And so there may not always be the opportunity for the physician or the healthcare provider to make good follow-up so that the caregiver can bring their child for follow-up services to be able to get a diagnosis. And so there's often an immediate um, and urgent need to address the symptoms. So the other conditions that children experience are um, nosebleeds and allergies, which I'll show some images of those in a moment. And what we know, unfortunately, is that this affects quality of life because children cannot live a normal life compared to their children to other children. And it also affects the mental health of not only children, but also their caregivers. So the common chronic conditions are asthma, allergies, and nosebleeds. And you can see these are images from our photo voice project um, of, a, a, of a child who has allergies, you can see here, and then this same child the caregiver took an image of them um, in their chronic nose bleeds. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, this affects the quality of life of these children because they experience high school absence, absences. They frequently, their caregivers make decisions to keep their children indoors, especially in times when um, there are, uh, there's poor air quality outside, there's going to be a dust storm, has been a dust storm, and these children frequently use healthcare services. So our current work, as I mentioned, um, is funded by PCORI, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. It's an engagement award. PCORI provides a funding mechanism in which you can receive two years of money essentially for planning and for building the capacity of different stakeholders in research to be able to move forward um, patient-centered and um, engaged work. So the project that we have right now, Empowering Latinx and Indigenous Latin American Caregivers of Children with Asthma, in collaboration with our um, community members, of which we have two different kind of governing boards as part of this research study, have renamed our project to Luchando por una vida digna y saludable, which is fighting for um, a dignified and healthy life. And I'd like to share that we, as part of this project, we have a series of capacity building um, talks and then trainings. So we've already had our first talk and we will have our second talk next week and it will be focused on healthcare services use. And it will be presented by Gabriela Ortiz and Nancy Del Castillo. Ga Gabriela is a PhD candidate in anthropology at, at UCR and Nancy is one of our promotores for Unidos por Salud. And this will be a really important talk one of the things that we've learned um, is many, many caregivers, if they can cross the border to Mexico, they choose to bring their child, their children or child um, across the border to Mexicali to access healthcare services because they feel that they can get a better diagnosis and better treatment plan utilizing services within Mexico. Um, but we welcome you all to consider joining us for this talk. We have four talks, and then we also have a series, um, uh, a training series that builds capacity around community-based participatory research, ethics and research, and clinical comparative effectiveness research. And this is my contact information. Um, if you're interested to learn more about this project and other projects, um, consider following us or uh, scan the QR code, which is our website, which I say is always under construction. And thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Cheney. This is such a great presentation. Um, I really like the honesty you had in, in the, the flow of the level of community engagement and to acknowledge that everybody starts somewhere and eventually ends up um, where you want the community to lead. Um, that's really great. Uh, and with that, I wanted to transition over to, to uh, Sandra. Um, Sandra is a, uh, let me uh, pull up my notes. Oh, Sandra is a resident of the ECB. I've worked with her for several years. She um, works with Alianza, but she also started and leads the Coachella Valley 
um, parents. And that is a group that, that works to advocate the voice of uh, equity for children in the school districts there. Um, she also works on several other projects. She works alongside with Dr. Uh, Cheney, and she works with Alianza on several other projects. She always has great things to say, and that's why we wanted her to come and contribute to this, to give the local perspective. Um, she sent me a presentation, so I'm going to share my screen and then um, share her presentation on Google Slides. And so, Sandra, you can just tell me... Um, when to move to the next slide. Let's get it going. Okay. I'll hand I'll hand this over to Sandra. Gracias, Dr. Sinclair. Uh, yo voy a hablar en español, así que si alguien necesita traducción en inglés, se pueden comenzar a, a conectar en el, con las instrucciones que les dieron al principio. Abajo está el, el icono del el, como el mundo. Entonces, um, los que no puedan hablar español, ingle, español perdón, y que necesiten la traducción en inglés, se pueden poner ahí. Usted me avisa, doctor. Uh, you can tell me, Ryan, when I can start. Thank you. Okay, I'm I'm ready to hear. So go ahead. Gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Sandra Ramírez. Yo soy residente del de este del Valle de Coachella. Como dijo el doctor Sinclair, um, Yo soy ama de casa, tengo cuatro niños y tengo más de 20 años viviendo aquí en el este del Valle de Coachella. Y la parte que me tocó a mí es darle un poquito de perspectiva, un poquito de contexto, más a detalle de cómo es uh, que nos, cómo nosotros como residentes, ¿verdad? Cuáles son las inequidades o situaciones de vida que pasamos el día a día. Una de las cosas que nosotros tenemos, uh, doctor Sinclair, que can you press in the first um, picture, please? Thank you. Yo, lo que yo hice fue mostrarles un poquito de cómo es que, aparte de, a pesar de las inequidades, injusticias de el ambiente, del medio ambiente que tenemos aquí en el este del Valle de Coachella, aún así nosotros como, como residentes buscamos la manera de cómo nosotros podemos luchar, ¿verdad? Cómo nosotros podemos unir esfuerzos y de esa manera nosotros pedir lo que necesitamos. Porque pueden venir muchas personas de muchas partes del Estado, pero nadie más que nosotros que vivimos aquí en la, cerca de la laguna y que todos los días estamos viviendo el día a día, ya sea los, los olores, ya sea cuando a veces hay quemazones, um, que son clandestinos. Ustedes saben cómo las, los niños ni siquiera pueden ir a la escuela por cómo está el medio ambiente. Entonces, quiero dar primero las gracias al equipo por haberme dado esta oportunidad y los residentes que están en este momento aquí en esta presentación, créanme que van a ser representados por mí y lo voy a hacer de la mejor manera. Uh, can you go to the next picture, please? La... Una de las cosas que nosotros tenemos aquí en el este del Valle de Coachella, pues es que más bien que no tenemos, necesitamos muchos espacios, ¿verdad? Espacios que nos pro, que nos provean pues aire acondicionado, espacios que donde nosotros podamos reunirnos. Como pueden ver las fotos la que vamos a estar viendo ahorita, la mayoría son de fotos que hemos tomado al aire libre porque a pesar de que tengamos Los climas de este lado del este del Valle de Coachella son muy extremos cuando hace calor es muy fuerte y cuando hace frío, pues de igual manera está, está, es, es muy frío. Pero aún así nosotros como residentes nos unimos para hablar no solamente de lo que queremos ver, sino cómo lo queremos ver. Y en unas de estas juntas, en muchas de estas reuniones siempre planeamos a dónde tenemos que ir, dónde tenemos que hablar, cómo lo vamos a decir. Next picture, please. Yo le voy a estar, todas estas fotos que están viendo ustedes, 
um, son solamente fotos de, de nosotros, ¿verdad? Esta es una escuela que nos prestaron porque nosotros tenemos que de alguna manera tocar puertas, de ver cómo se nos abren esos espacios para tener una, pues una reunión más amena, donde se provea el aire acondicionado o lo que necesitemos. Y las mamás que ustedes están viendo en estas fotos, ellas son de alguna manera abogadoras por su comunidad, porque cada una de ellas son de diferentes, de diferentes ciudades o diferentes pueblitos, ¿verdad? Porque el este del Valle de Cochela se conforma por solamente ciudades no incorporadas, pequeños pueblitos. Algunas son de Oasis, Termal, Meca, North Shore. Uh, y nosotros pensamos que el hecho de que Desert Shores o Salton City pertenezcan al Valle Imperial, eso no los hace que nosotros no los, no los podamos incluir. Nosotros pensamos que podemos ser un solo Cochela y por eso es que nos estamos extendiendo hasta allá. Next picture, please. Eh, entonces, ¿qué es lo que nosotros pasamos el día a día? Pues yo desde que llegué a este país, eh, escuché rumores, ¿verdad? Que, que se iba a limpiar la laguna, que íbamos a tener un mejor medio ambiente. Uh, lo que yo como madre de familia y miembro de la comunidad he visto que pues han, han, han habido muchas promesas desde que yo llegué hace más de 20 años, pero quiero agradecer a las organizaciones que están ahorita haciendo algo que ya se ve no solamente las organizaciones locales como Alianza o otras organizaciones, sino también, por ejemplo, veo que el Estado ya está tomándonos más en cuenta. Para mí eso es algo muy esperanzador, porque nosotros como madres de familia, yo, por ejemplo, tengo un hijo que tiene asma, tengo mi niño, el el, tengo cuatro hijos y el tercero de mis hijos, él cuando iba a la escuela cada rato me llamaban porque estaba sangrando y así, simplemente de repente... Entonces, hay muchas enfermedades que todavía no estamos seguros si es por el salto en sí o el medio ambiente que tenemos, porque pues vivimos en un desierto, ¿verdad? Y hay muchos factores que influyen para tener un, me un medio ambiente que no es muy saludable. Next picture, please. Um, entonces, este, um, yo estoy aquí para dar la perspectiva de cómo yo, muchas de las mamás que están en estas fotos están pasando lo mismo que yo, las preocupaciones de cómo es que nosotros tenemos muchas inequidades, ¿verdad? Tenemos muchas cosas que influyen para, el, para la, un medio ambiente no muy saludable. Los, es, los expertos ya, los, ya lo dijeron, ya dieron los números y todo, pero yo como vivo aquí, yo lo puedo ver que, pues, a cada rato hay quemadero, hay quemazón clandestina, como um, a, hay veces que se han tenido que cerrar las escuelas porque los rancheros eh, con sus químicos que ponen para sus plantas o para su agricultura, a veces lo, lo ponen a deshoras donde los niños pueden eh, oler esos químicos y eso no es muy saludable. Yo, por ejemplo, puedo dar mi experiencia cuando yo llegué a este país Uh, yo no tenía ninguna alergia, pero llegué aquí y pues desafortunadamente me empezaron a salir granitos alrededor de todas las coyunturas de mi cuerpo y resulta que yo era alérgica. Yo soy alérgica, eh, bueno era porque parece que ya no me salen, era alérgica a los químicos que se echaban en el campo, a, específicamente al azufre porque pues yo nunca había trabajado en ese tipo de campos y Uh, la verdad, aquí como nosotros vivimos, la, no nos queda de otra más que estar, estar haciendo lo que, lo que se presente, porque tenemos que igual pagar la renta y todo. Entonces, a veces en los espacios cuando la gente no va, no es que no les interese su salud, no es que no les interese ver algo diferente, es que la, lo que nos queda es acoplarnos. Otra de las cosas que quiero comentar es que cuando yo llegué también, hay una planta que está cerca de Meca. Yo llegué al pueblo de Meca, a vivir a Meca. Y una de las cosas que me di cuenta es que esa planta olía a palomitas. No sé si alguien viva cerca de Meca que estén aquí, pero todos los días olía a palomitas y específicamente por las tardes. Entonces yo, yo pensaba que era una fábrica de palomitas, pero no. Alguien me comentó que la verdad es que pues no, es una planta de reciclaje. Y creo que muchas de las cosas que yo estoy diciendo ya en algún momento se han dicho, ¿verdad? Pero es importante que nosotros hagamos seco y sigamos diciendo qué es lo que queremos. Queremos que se tome en cuenta este, este lado del este del Valle de Cochela, porque la mayoría pues somos, somos de bajos ingresos, la mayoría somos uh, agricultores o hablamos español, 
y la mayoría, yo lo que he visto, somos mexicanos, casi no me ha tocado ver gente de otras nacionalidades, somos mexicanos, y lo otro es que somos personas de color. Entonces, um, no sé por qué, pero tenemos todas las cosas que influyen para tener un ambiente muy tóxico. Entonces, no, eso, el hecho de que nosotros tengamos todas esas, o tengamos todo eso de que somos de color, hablamos español, somos de bajos ingresos, eso no nos hace menos merecedores, ¿verdad?, de tener o aspirar o luchar porque nuestros hijos que van a estar aquí y que son las generaciones futuras tengan un medio ambiente más saludable. Otra de las cosas que también quiero comentar es que personas a, del grupo de mamás que, que comparto o mis vecinos también, personas que conozco, parece que tienen los mismos problemas que yo o se quejan de lo mismo, ¿verdad?, de que pues no, no hay mucho acceso a la salud. Desafortunadamente, nosotros tenemos muchas personas que viven en la sombra porque son personas que no tienen un seguro social o que no tienen un estatus legal. Entonces, al momento del censo, todavía les da miedo hacerse contar porque tienen miedo a, a represalias, tienen miedo a que alguien les diga algo o a que si en una, en una casa, las casas son multifamiliares, aunque no tengan el espacio, viven hasta dos o tres familias para poder alcanzar, para poder sostenerse. Entonces, por eso es que no se hacen contar. Pero yo siempre he pensado que nosotros ya estamos listos para tener una clínica grande o un, o un, este, un hospital del condado. Se puede poner del lado de North Shore o en Meca, donde en Meca muchas personas van ahí o del otro lado que viene siendo en la Chapala, a uh, los que conocen el área es acá por Termal. Entonces, eh, son, esas, son esas muchas de las, de las necesidades que tenemos. Porque si nosotros expresamos lo que tenemos, ¿verdad? De que no hay mucho transporte, transporte público, desafortunadamente también esa es otra de las cosas que ya están quitando las líneas del camión, ya no están yendo tan seguido a North Shore. Y eso influye también para que las personas, pues la salud, el estrés, la salud no sea muy óptima y el estrés pues aumente todavía más este, también lo que quiero comentar es de que no, el Salton sí hubiera, debería de ser un lugar recreacional desafortunadamente todavía faltan muchas cosas para que se pueda hacer porque eso influiría también mucho a la salud emocional, a la prevención de sobrepeso para las personas que podemos tener acceso ahí y, y lo otro es que también cobran ¿verdad? El parque que tenemos, el parque estatal que está adelantito de North Shore, mucha gente todavía no sabe que existe, pero ese parque necesita un poco de revitalización para que pueda ser, pueda, pueda ser un espacio donde nosotros los comunales, las personas que vivimos alrededor de la laguna, podamos ir y podamos disfrutar. Y sobre todo tener nuestros hijos que puedan tener un espacio donde desestresarse, donde desarrollarse y donde practicar su deporte. Otra de las cosas que también nosotros pasamos como personas aquí de, del este del Valle de Cochela es que, como dije anteriormente, no hay mucho acceso a la salud. Entonces, a, a veces recolectar la DARA o recolectar los datos, perdón, estoy hablando en español, recolectar los datos de, de las enfermedades que aquejan a la comunidad, tal vez a, a veces no es tan factible porque las personas que, que no tienen papeles y que son de bajos ingresos difícilmente van a ir a una, van a viajar hasta Cochela, que es Omeca, que es la clínica más cercana para los que viven de, de este lado del este, o van a ir hasta Indio, porque a veces no, no solamente es el hecho de que no tienen un ingreso que les pueda sustentar una visita al doctor, sino también a veces es que ni siquiera tienen transporte. Entonces, todo es como un efecto dominó. Si nosotros no tenemos una cosa, nos afecta a todo lo demás. Y otra de las cosas también es que, por ejemplo, en North Shore, ¿verdad? Este, tenemos un Jack Club, el lugar donde es, aparentemente es un lugar donde las personas pueden ir a hacer sus ejercicios o los niños pueden ir a hacer como un parque recreacional, no exactamente un parque. Pero, y también hay un parque, pero todo está tan lejos, las casas están tan retiradas, no hay banquetas. Entonces, uh, difícilmente yo como madre no me gustaría caminar en un lugar donde no hay banquetas porque... La banqueta lo protege a uno como peatón para que los carros mantengan su distancia o se pongan en el camino donde deben ir. Y otra de las cosas que nos aqueja también aquí a nosotros es que pues no hay muchas guarderías también. Hay muchas cosas, de verdad. Eh, yo creo que yo no acabaría con, con los 12 minutos que me dieron para, para decir las necesidades. 
Pero lo que nosotros, yo lo que quiero decir es de que recalcar más bien y resaltar que nosotros comunidad, como comunidad sí estamos conscientes de lo que necesitamos y tratamos de aprovechar los espacios. Este espacio que están viendo ahorita ustedes es el parque de Desert Shores. Es solamente una, una sombra y hay como dos o tres juegos ahí que obviamente si también se necesita una revitalización, algo que sea más atractivo, algo que haya un lugar donde se puedan poner las bicicletas, una cosa que se puedan usar las patinetas porque todo es pura tierra, el cemento es bien poquito. Entonces, este, nosotros queremos dejarles saber a, a las personas. Esta es una foto que, está, uh, ok, gracias. Por, <risa> nosotros estamos tratando de buscar espacios donde no solamente sea un lugar donde nosotros charlemos de cuáles son nuestras necesidades, cuáles son nuestras inquietudes, sino también un momento de desestresarnos, porque como dije anteriormente, desafortunadamente no se han creado muchos programas alternativos para nuestros jóvenes y para nosotros los padres también, porque también nosotros nos cansamos y necesitamos un lugar. Entonces nosotros tenemos que andar tocando puertas, buscando lugares donde se nos dé la oportunidad de hacer algo recreacional, algo que sirva para los, los residentes que, como dije anteriormente, no solamente escuchar las charlas comunitarias de qué es lo que está pasando o cómo se sienten, sino también un momento de compartir comunidad, crear comunidad, y a, y a la misma vez también sirve de un poco de, desestresa, de, de desestrés, desestresarse uno mismo, pensando en la salud mental, en la salud emocional, nosotros tenemos la esperanza de que algún día seamos escuchados y poco a poco, yo sé que no es todo de la noche a la mañana, yo sé que todo es un proceso y hay muchos permisos y hay muchas cosas que se tienen que cumplir antes de cumplir una meta o, o poder realizar lo que nosotros como comunales queremos ver. Y todo esto también es pensando no solamente en, en nosotros, sino en las generaciones futuras, ¿verdad?, ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué es lo que le vamos a dejar a ellos? ¿O qué es lo que nosotros estamos creando más bien para ellos? Porque eh, nosotros podemos decir que son las generaciones futuras, pero la verdad es que son las generaciones de la hora. De la hora, porque ahora esos niños, esos jóvenes necesitan un lugar, donde, un lugar seguro donde ellos puedan interactuar, donde ellos puedan hacer algo alternativo, no solamente en la casa. Y como les dije, las, la, los pequeños pueblitos, hay muchas cosas que están necesitando. A veces, por ejemplo, la comunidad de North Shore tiene el mismo código postal de Meca. Entonces uno pensaría que tal vez por eso también la comunidad de North Shore no ha crecido en su totalidad o no se han llevado más recursos a esa comunidad. Necesitamos el, allá necesitan, por ejemplo, el alumbrado público, las banquetas, el desagüe, muchas cosas que se necesitan. Y yo estoy agradecida con, con la organización también de Alianza, que el doctor Sinclair es parte de ese equipo de la justicia ambiental, donde se está creando una manera de no solamente identificar los problemas, sino una solución a largo plazo. Porque podemos decir, ah, pues vamos a hacer un evento, vamos a hacer esto, pero lo que queremos en ese grupo de justicia ambiental es que se cree algo que las generaciones futuras también van a, van a favorecer o, van a, o se van a beneficiar. También he sido parte de los espacios con la doctora Cheney, he colaborado con ella en las investigaciones, uh, haciendo los focus group, recolectando um, encuestas y en diferentes proyectos, lo cual todo eso para mí, como les digo, es muy esperanzador para que todo, todo, lo, que, todo lo que nos aqueja en algún momento nosotros podamos decir, ok, tenemos lo que necesitamos y vamos a, a hacer uso de ello. Y yo vivo, yo vivo, yo viví en Meca, actualmente vivo en Coachella, pero yo voy mucho para Meca, para North Shore. Entonces yo puedo ver, ¿verdad? Cómo es que las comunidades todavía seguimos en necesidades. Todavía también hay muchos ranchos donde no tienen un pozo que tenga un filtro de agua y los residentes de ese rancho o ese parqueadero de trailers están teniendo que hacer uso de esa agua que está muy contaminada con muchos metales pesados. Um, y lo que también yo he visto, ¿verdad?, es de que hay muy poco, muy poco acceso a tener una vivienda, no solamente a rentar, pero todos cuando nos venimos a este país, venimos con el sueño americano de algún día tener algo propio, ya sea una traila, sea un, una casa, pero desafortunadamente, como volvemos a lo mismo, la, el ingreso o la razón de que somos de bajos ingresos, pareciera que el sueño americano se hace una pesadilla 
porque es algo muy lejano de poder alcanzar. Este, también otra de las cosas que, como no hay programas alternativos para los jóvenes en ninguna de las comunidades, o hay muy pocos, o están muy lejos, o muy limitados, que a veces es, eso es lo que pasa, que en los, uh, por ejemplo, en, los, en el Boys and Girls Club, piden muchos requisitos para que los jóvenes puedan ser parte de, y ahora, si en, lo, en los pocos ya, uh, perdón, este, Boys and Girls Clubs que hay aquí, en Coche, uno en Cochela y uno en Meca, si alguien no tiene carro, pues definitivamente no va a poder llevar a su niño ahí. Entonces nosotros creo que o el gobierno, las entidades, las organizaciones, se tiene que hacer algo más intencional de que todos esos pequeños uh, parqueaderos de trailas que per pertenezcan a la, al, al pueblo que pertenezcan tienen que ser tomados en cuenta y de verdad intencionalmente hacer algo para que esos jóvenes, esos niños tengan un espacio. Este, otra de las cosas que también eh, desafortunadamente pasa, ¿verdad? Es que la mayoría de las personas del este del Valle de Cochela trabajan en, el, en la agricultura, en el campo, pero la realidad es que cuando uno va a la tienda, pues está muy cara la, la verdura, está muy caro todo. Entonces siempre se van a ir a la opción de agarrar algo más barato, aunque no sea lo más saludable. Y otra de las cosas es de que uh, hay muy pocas tiendas y las tiendas pues suben los precios muy altos, entonces... Esa es otra cosa que el comer saludable se hace también inalcanzable por la falta de, de inversionistas que quieran poner tiendas en los pueblos que están más lejanos de la ciudad y así las personas que no tienen carro puedan ir a esa tienda y, y puedan realmente comer una comida saludable porque es hasta un poquito irónico, ¿verdad? Que las personas que plantan y cosechan las verduras y los cítricos, la fruta, no puedan comerla porque no la pueden comprar porque no está al alcance de su bolsillo. Y también este es el, en el parque que les, bueno, quise mostrar un poquito de fotos porque yo puedo decirle muchas cosas, pero me quise enseñarles cómo es que se, está, se están haciendo muchos esfuerzos en la comunidad. Esta fue una junta que tuvimos allá en el parque, en el parque estatal de, de aquí de adelante de North Shore. Esas plantas que están en medio son plantas naturales, son plantas de la región. Y ahí se hizo esa reunión para igual um, preguntarle a la comunidad qué le gustaría ver en ese parque, ¿verdad? Para que se haga un poco atractivo. Um, eso fue el año pasado, ha sido, es un poco lento el proceso, pero tenemos esperanza que pues sí, lo podamos ver. Y otra de las cosas también es que nuestras personas que son de la tercera edad a veces viven en, con familias que pues no los tratan muy bien o no les hacen mucho caso. Entonces, uh, esa es otra cosa que también tenemos que tomar en cuenta, que tenemos que cuidar a nuestros abuelitos y aunque la gente pues, se dedica trabajando, hay personas que tienen hasta dos o tres trabajos por la misma razón de que de alguna manera tienen, tienen que sustentar pues, no solamente su renta, su casa, su, su comida, la gasolina, todo lo que, lo que implica mantener un hogar. En, y a veces no es que no quieran hacerle caso a los niños o no es que no quieran hacerle caso a los ancianitos, es que Uh, la verdad es algo que pues ellos tienen, tenemos que todavía o tienen, ¿verdad? De alguna manera que traer el pan a la mesa de su casa. Entonces, uh, hay muchas, yo, yo diría que debe, podemos comenzar por limpiar la laguna, por tener una, este es, ah, ok, que, gracias por esta foto. Esta foto es una muestra de que aún así como está la laguna con todos los olores y todo, nosotros tratamos de hacer uso. Ese es un, a un lado de la laguna, no es un espacio en específico, simplemente a un lado de la laguna donde encontramos un lugar donde estacionarnos y ese evento pues lo hicimos a manera de lunada. Igual como dije, fue una charla bajo la luna. Tenemos que tratar de idear um, cosas atractivas para la comunidad y que disfruten y que traten de conocer los lugares porque hay personas que están aquí y no conocen. Entonces, no solamente es crear comunidad, sino también es disfrutar de lo que ya tenemos. Entonces, si ya lo estamos disfrutando así como está, imagínense si lo tenemos con más atracciones o que ya no huela tanto, no sé. Yo sé que esto es a largo plazo y esto también, esto es en, uh, fuimos caminando a la laguna para ver qué podemos hacer. Uh, creo que nosotros estamos con toda la intención de realmente ver los cambios ver los cambios y aunque se ve un poquito tosco todo ese lugar, pero es muy, muy, este, muy satisfactorio disfrutar, ¿verdad?, de caminar y tener contacto con la naturaleza 
porque yo creo que para poder querer cambiar algo o poder ver, querer ver algo diferente, primero tenemos que conocer, conocer lo que tenemos. Entonces, por eso nosotros nos hemos dado la tarea de ir y caminar, y, ok, ¿qué es lo que tenemos? ¿Qué es lo que necesitamos? ¿Y cómo lo queremos? Entonces, este, no sé, doctor Sinclair, usted me dice si me estoy pasando porque yo puedo hablar mucho. Oh, okay, Sandra, thank you. Um, You're welcome. I think we, we probably need to go to question and answers now. We're a little okay. bit towards the end, but I really enjoyed looking at some of these pictures and hearing about all of the, the needs, but also the unique um, resilience that our community and the ECB has. So with that, let's, let's move on to question and answers. You had a lot of comments while you were talking as well, Sandra. Okay, uh, thank you came in. Um, so um, let's let's just move on now to questions and answers. I saw that maybe if everybody, uh, all the panelists can turn on their screens um, or turn on their cameras, I guess. Um, I saw that there was a lot of questions that came in for various topics. I'm trying to um, uh, de-share my, my screen. Um, you know, there is a question and answer um, a list here. So I'll just start going through the question answers and, or the questions that are out there. And then we can just take them as we go. Now, the this webinar was supposed to end at 1.30, but I can stay on until 2. So feel free to, to drop off if you have to. Otherwise, um, I think we're going to keep going if we can. Is that OK, Michael? Yeah, that's great. If the panelists can stay on. I think there's okay. a lot of Q&A and it'd be great to have a good discussion. Thanks. Yeah, so here's um, some discussion points. There's a lot of um, different questions on different topics, but um, just getting back to some of the health um, topics here, you know, we are all looking at different um, things with health from asthma to others, but one um, participant, Pat Holland, had asked about um, uh, a couple of different things. I um, there the what she, what this person asked about was: uh, Have you looked at ADHD in kids from exposure to toxins? They also asked about um, uh, miscarriages or birth defects from ag pollutants, as well as um, just in general birth defects and miscarriages. So that that was a series of three questions. But does anybody have an answer to that? about about these issues, um, these environmental contaminants in relation to um, to um, uh, symptoms. I can comment just from from our study, we have not looked at these conditions. Some of them are relatively rare, and so um, it can be a little bit difficult to study some of these conditions without a larger study. Um, but I think it's, you know, a great question and this might be something to tackle with, say, national level data to get a more um, accurate picture of some of these pesticides in relation to these conditions. But that's a great question. Yeah, thanks. Um, anyone else? So I can also just comment that our team hasn't necessarily, we haven't specifically studied these topics, um, but they have come up because we, are in our project for, um, infant nutrition and feeding, we focus on infants zero to four months of age. And so while um, it's not necessarily part of our specific research questions, developmental um, concerns and ADHD, things like this have just come up because we've been doing work with children. Great, thanks, Anne. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't look into those um, to those issues either for like, uh, and Dr. Farzan mentioned they're, they're very rare. Um, so we didn't feel that they were um, something that we needed to look at. Yeah, great. So um, the, uh, the next question that came in was um, uh, from John Armstrong. And it was about um, the Dr. David Lowe's work at UCR talking about a previous Salt and Sea Summit in April, 2022, talking about um, there was an identified bacterial component in the Salt and Sea. Um, 
And then in the, the following summer, he mentioned the same thing, but saying it was coming from alfalfa cattle fields and that he saw something like this in the Central Valley as well. Um, and I was wondering if anyone here has heard anything um, or they say, is anything more known on this that you know of? Um, I haven't personally, I haven't heard more than just what the, this person has asked in the, in the uh, question and answer. Good. Well, we'll log that as a question that I need to get to Dr. Lowe <laughs> um, and go unanswered for now. Um, the next question is about the, um, the brackish water. So um, it's from Dan Bliss and it, um, he asks, there are 14 um, million acre feet of brackish water in an unrestricted aquifer under the Imperial Valley from 100 years of irrigation and it's shovel ready. And essentially, can we use that water to mitigate the, the dust issues from the Salton Sea? Does anybody here have any input on that? Uh, I'll just jump in. We had a hydrologic uh, or a study on hydrology or webinar on hydrology um, recently, and there was a little bit of discussion on groundwater. Um, but uh, there, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab, I think, did a study on that as well and found it was pretty expensive. But why don't we really focus here on the public health questions? I think we've got a lot of interesting questions and not as much time to cover them. Sure thing. So, um, uh, Virginia Gwynn from um, um, she, she's asking about what public health environmental data is most needed in our opinions. And um, I think we all probably all have an answer to that, but what do we need to know the most? Uh, and what's the most urgent um, public health environmental um, data that we, that we need? So let's, let's go around and answer that one. Um, Sandra, let's start with you on this one. Um, what what do you think is one of the most urgent public health um, or environmental contaminant data that we need? I think the data are precisely the residents, because we can see the air, but we don't know what the air is. Y nosotros yo creo que basado en lo que los residentes pueden decir, cuáles son sus síntomas, cuáles son sus, qué es lo que se presenta en diferente tiempo, no sé si puede ser en una llovizna, porque a veces cuando llueve, desafortunadamente es cuando la laguna huele más. Yo no soy científica, pero me imagino que es porque el subsuelo, solo, todo lo que está en el subsuelo abajo de la tierra, es lo que sale con los vapores después de una lluvia. Entonces, yo diría que basado en lo que los residentes digan, porque nosotros podemos asumir o los científicos pueden asumir que, que es lo que se, se, ellos, en, basados en su conocimiento, piensan, pero realmente creo que siempre tiene que estar por delante la experiencia de la comunidad y no solamente la experiencia de lo que están viviendo, sino lo que ya les ha pasado en el pasado en diferentes tiempos. Gracias. Great answer. Thank you, Sandra. Um, uh, does anyone else want to contribute to this question? Yeah, I would say in, in some of the data that I shared today, um, and it's some of the colleagues that presented also uh, mentioned it is the underreporting on respiratory health, um, you know, problems or diseases. So I think you know, getting accurate data on that, I think will be invaluable to, you know, or very valuable, I should say, for, um, you know, for, for us moving forward. So we could, you know, accurately start, you know, uh, designing, implementing, um, you know, interventions for the community. Great. Um... I, uh, you know, I've been doing community science. I'll take a little stab at it as well. I've been doing community science out there for a while, um, trying to take leadership um, uh, or give leadership to community members to, to do the science and to lead the science. Um, it is a process to get to that point. But um, one, one of the things that um, 
I was going to say is that, you know, um, rather than uh, there, there's so many, there's so many different topics that can go into a health study, but there is this assembly bill that's coming up. And I think it's important to have community members um, write and talk to um, the office of Eduardo Garcia about what they want this health study to include. Um, and so that's, that's what I, I would, um, I would say, um, I've heard a lot of different things from community members about what should be um, in a survey, but I really think that it, it has to start on, and, you know, just has to be from community um, for that question. So I, I want to add to, um, I know there's a lot of discussion about, well, we need more epidemiological studies. And I would have to say that Dr. Farson's study has been really important for making arguments that there is clearly a problem um, around res respiratory health among children in particular, at least those are the data that we have. Um, and so I, I wanna push back at some levels at that idea because we know that this is a problem. We've, we've been able to establish this. And so we need to find solutions. And there's a lot of discussion about, well, how do we change the environment? How do we change the sea? And so that's been happening for years. Um, but what isn't happening is what do we do? How do we prepare our healthcare systems? How do we train our doctors to recognize that this type of asthma, um, perhaps it could be different. How do we train them to understand how the environment interacts with uh, or can shape the health conditions, chronic health conditions of individuals living in environmental justice communities? And how can we build the capacity of investigative teams to be able to do clinical research because we need to know what is in the bodies of these children. So we can do animal models and we have um, Dr. Lowe is an example and others who are doing work on this. So I really think that we need to think about what ways can we intervene that can be meaningful to the community and help them with getting better diagnosis, with better treatments, things like that. I completely agree. Uh, Dr. Cheney, I think, you know, this issue has, you know, um, has already an abundance of data. And, and I think now it's, it's maybe moving to the next step um, and, and finding some solutions. So I would love to have discussions around that because um, we as, as, a, as a healthcare district are very interested in, in, in this topic. So, you know, um, whenever y'all have a moment, you know, Dr. Farzan, you know, Dr. Cheney and, and the rest of the members here, I would love to maybe convene a meeting and, and start discussing and let's, let's start talking about some possible solutions some mitigation efforts that we could collectively do and how it could maybe look um, externally or internally too, because we do have funding available at the Desert Healthcare District, but maybe collectively go for some larger grants to really start making an impact and really start honing in on those interventions because we don't want to study. We, we could study all of this till the cows come home and we're always going to come to the same conclusion that there is an impact, that the children are suffering. So now I think it's to take, it's, it's, um, is for us to take that next step and now start designing some of these interventions to really start making an impact in the lives of these children and, and some of the residents that live right around the Salem Sea. It's a good it's a good thing to bring up because there has been a lot of studies done, and um, uh, I, uh, I I think about the sometimes I when when I think about the uh, the studies that are done, I also think about lawyers and what would it take to get to the point of um, you know showing causation here. But maybe that's not the question that we need to think about. I'm not sure. Um, maybe we need to start fixing things even before we can get to that um, exact point. So yeah, I appreciate that that concept here. And so this is this is an interesting interesting discussion about that. I just add to, you know, I think that we've made a ton of progress in the last, say, five years. Like these were not conversations that were happening um, just a few years ago. And so, you know, the new renewed focus on public health, I think, is so important. Um, and I think we do have a good evidence base now, but that needs to be translated into policies. And so what we need to do is take that step to really think about what could happen at a state level, local level, school level, 
um, personal level. Um, and one of the things we've been thinking about too is this idea of cumulative burden. You know, we're talking about the salt and sea here, but we're also talking about pesticides. Um, lithium has come up in the chat, um, agricultural burning. There are just so many things to contend with. And so I think really thinking about the cumulative burden and making sure that's reflected in some of the, um, you know, the metrics that we have, which it's not necessarily done at this time. So Cal and Virus Green is great, but um, it may not really rec fully capture um, the extent of the issue. So um, that's just my thoughts. Thanks. There's there as we're talking about this, there's plenty of comments coming in as well um, about that um, and some of the more data that we need, and then also what those different interventions would look like. Um, let's see if. If we do run out of time, I just say that we're keeping all of these questions and we'll definitely, members of the panel will definitely reach out um, with answers to these. But let me just keep going in the order of the questions here. The next one was from Pat Holland again. Um, have you worked with Beyond Pesticides and environmental lawyers um, like at Children's Health Defense to make the makers of the poisons pay for the damage um, to human health and to the environment? Um, I, I personally, I haven't gone that route yet with any, anything in the Eastern Coachella Valley. And, um, as far as, um, those groups go, but Dr. Cheney did link the, um, the Chamaco study from the Central Valley. And I do believe that they have gone a bit farther with pesticide studies up there. Um, we're just starting out. There's an AQMD, SC AQMD study that looked at air quality um, uh, pesticides. Um, and, and they just got the data in, I think, March, and they're still processing it before they produce their report. Um, does anybody else want to comment on that topic? Okay, let's move on to the next one from Roger. Um, have there been any studies done to show exactly uh, that show exactly from where specific air quality contamination is coming? For example, are all the contaminants coming from the receding salt and sea, or are there contaminants coming from the desert west of the sea? Is there a difference between PM two point five, PM ten, and or toxics? Um, anyone want to want to start with that? I can say something about this. I think, um, you know, this is this is data that we're currently collecting and analyzing. And as I mentioned, we're a bit delayed in those analyses. But um, I think there is some evidence that there are, you know, different sources that are contributing to air quality in um, Eastern Coachella Valley as well as Imperial. Um, and I think it remains to be seen sort of the relative contributions from these different sources that's actually reaching the communities. But um, that is something that we're looking at and planning to link to our health data. Um, and we're doing that at the moment. I just don't have it to share today. Great. Um, the next one is from Jasmine Phillips. I'm interested to know if researchers have confirmed the presence of cyanotoxins on dust particles from salt and sea playa. I recall there was a recent report published by UCR, but is only available to the public for purchase. I'd appreciate an answer. So Jasmine, there is, I'm not sure about the report that you're talking about with UCR, but I know that there's a report just produced about um, a year ago uh, from Jeff Jeresi at the um, uh, uh, Colorado River Regional Water Quality Board. And um, I can I can uh, try to find that and pass it along to you. And it does mention some about um, uh, cyanobac cyanotoxins, cyanobacteria. Actually, I don't know if it mentions cyanotoxins. Um, oh, okay, another one just came in, and this is on the lithium topic. Um, so any, is there any ideas from anybody about lithium mining and when it happens, how will that affect health issues highlighted in today's presentations? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. I think that still is, it's up, you know, um, 
still up in the air. I think that's that's part of the research that is going to be ongoing as part of the conversations that are happening with with the different companies that are doing the extraction and making sure that um, you know that the environmental health impacts studies are also conducted to ensure what is going to be the ultimate you know impact on the health not only of of of, of the residents but also the environment as in, in general so that is still to be determined i believe great um yeah lithium is um definitely something that people are watching but uh i i don't have any any answer on that as of yet I'll just add to that. I think that, you know, it the we don't know much about the mining itself, but what we do know is that there is going to be a lot of construction, a lot more truck traffic, um, a lot more dust generated from every all of these activities that are going to build the infrastructure for lithium mining. And so that we can say will impact air quality most likely. And so um, I think that does need to be um, factored into this discussion. And then uh, Michael Cohen just commented that there's going to be a webinar on lithium uh, next month. So that'll be good. Um, and then uh, Jasmine actually corrected me. There was not a report from Jeff Jurassi, but it was from UCR researchers, only available to read if purchased. I haven't heard of that uh, report, uh, um, but it might be there. Are you are you familiar with that one, Anne? No, okay. I'm interested if it's there. Um, okay, so, you know, there's plenty of other comments and plenty of other things to talk about here. Um, what I, I really like to hear about was um, Sandra's um, resilience in dealing with what all of the cumulative challenges that there are and some of the different um, approaches that they have for dealing with things. And also the um, the question that Mike Cohen asked about, like, what can we do currently? What are th some things that we can do? So several people asked about um, air filters in schools. Some people ask about air filters in homes. Um, and what about healthcare um, clinics? So, um, you know, what are some things here that are solutions now? I mean, like like uh, Anne and um, Dr. Anne and Dr. Uh, Farzan were talking about. You know, we do have plenty of data, but what are some um, what are some solutions now that we can um, start working on? I can um, comment that what we found in our um, study that happened in the context of COVID, our childhood asthma study, um, what caregivers noticed is when their children used face masks, that this was really beneficial to the reduction of their respiratory health symptoms. So that's a very immediate and easy solution in terms of um, asking your children to mask up when they leave the home or even in the home. Um, and then Dr. Will Porter at UCR, he and I are collaborating on a project right now in which we are training community members to um, build do-it-yourself air filtration systems. And these are the, the CR boxes, which have proven to be very effective. They're actually as effective, if not more effective, than your typical um, like standard manufactured air filtration systems. And it's a... Um, basically a pilot study in which we are engaging 50 households and collecting data prior to installing the um, air filtration systems and then after to see how well the air filtration systems clean the air. We're also monitoring by implementing air quality monitors in people's homes. So that's a, um, a great way as well. And feel free to contact me and I can put you in contact with um, uh, our program coordinator. We're done recruiting for this study, but um, we're happy to share resources and information about how to build your own filtration systems. That's great. Dr. Frazan just also shared a link to an infographic about how to build one of those. It's so funny. We have an infographic too, so I just put it in the thing, but definitely contact Dr. Cheney. <laughs> She's probably more of an expert than I am. 
in yeah. regards to the um, medical clinics, we do have um, a mobile medical unit um, that the Desert Healthcare District funded and a local Desert Physicians Medical Group, DPMG Health, operates. Um, and if there's any interest of actually deploying the medical unit um, out in, you know, around the Salton Sea area to do um, screenings for children and, and district residents around that area, please let me know. We would love to <clears throat> deploy that medical unit out. Um, we are and we're in the process of even getting a second one um, to increase our capacity for that. So um, if you like, um, we could you know deploy that out with with the full medical team that could could um, could do some some screenings there um, for the for the children and and the family. So. Um, please contact me if, if there's a need for that, and I would I would love to to get that you know that medical mobile unit out in that area. Okay, so it's about one fifty four, but let's let's wrap up. If there's there's final thoughts from from everybody, let's just go around. Um, let's start again with uh, well, let's start with with you, Alejandro, since you're up right now. Ah, uh, like. You know, I, I just want to thank the you know the panelists and um, you know Michael, you uh, Ryan, and and everybody here, the attendees of with the really good questions. I think you know for us um, as a healthcare district, we want you know to improve the health and wellness of our district residents. Um, and once again, like we mentioned, the data is there. So now I think it's it's for us to take that next step and and be you know a partner with all of these organizations, all the different researchers to see exactly what we could collectively do um, and be able to utilize some of our internal funds that we do have allocated for environmental health um, to start addressing some of these issues around asthma, um, air quality. Um, so we would, you know, we welcome any partnerships, collaborations, um, even, you know, um, grant applications through our, through our grant funding program. So um, I, I, I'm all ears, so just happy to be here. Yeah, let's, let's go to, um, Ann next. Um, so just thank you for, for being here and for listening to this webinar. Um, very happy to share any of the, the work that we've been doing. So feel free to contact me. And Dr. Farzan. Yeah, thanks again to the organizers. This has been great. And I just so appreciate the conversation focused on health. I think that's something that's just so critical and such a um, key piece of this issue. And, you know, all of the participants that the level of engagement around um, this issue is really just incredible. And I um, you know, so appreciate everyone's perspectives and questions, which you know, help guide our research. Um, so yeah, thank you. And also please feel free to reach out. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then, uh, Sandra. Gracias. Pues sí, un llamado no solamente a la comunidad, sino a las, a los, a las diferentes organizaciones que están aquí presentes y entidades que el ecosistema también incluye a las personas, los seres humanos que estamos aquí, y aunque todavía no se estén dando índices o, o indicaciones de que hay personas que están pereciendo a raíz de la contaminación, yo creo que no tenemos que esperarnos, ¿verdad? Porque no solamente es la flora y la fauna, sino los seres humanos que estamos viviendo alrededor. Y creo que me parece una muy buena idea que se estén haciendo este tipo de webinars donde se le pueda dar la oportunidad a la comunidad y esperanza para que sepan que algo está pasando, algo se está moviendo para tener un mejor clima, para que los residentes que vivimos acá en este lado tengamos uh, esperanza de que tengamos, de que nuestros hijos de, se amenoren los aquejamientos de la sangre de nasal, los ataques de asma, las, las alergias que hay muchas. Entonces yo siempre pienso que todos los que estamos alrededor de la laguna no le hace que seamos diferentes ciudades, diferentes condados. Creo que somos, solos una, somos todos una sola comunidad, una comunidad de seres humanos que aquí estamos y no nos vamos a ir. Y lo que necesitamos es unir esfuerzos y crear un medio ambiente saludable para nuestros hijos y para todos los que estamos aquí uh, ya viviendo 
También lo otro es que quiero agradecer a todas las entidades que se están interesando por nuestra comunidad. De verdad, eh, lo merecemos no, porque no somos personas de tercera calidad, somos igual que los demás de valiosos. Gracias a Dr. Cheney por su, um, su apoyo en traer los filtros y también al Desert Health District que dio el apoyo a Alianza para poder tener los monitores de aire. Entonces creo que el hecho de que cada organización o cada uno esté haciendo cosas diferentes, eso es muy esperanzador para nosotros la comunidad que en un futuro vamos, vamos a ver algo ya plasmado que esté pasando. Muchas gracias, doctor Sinclair y todo el equipo. Gracias. Yeah, um, I just want to say again, thanks for, for that, Sandra, and for bringing your perspective and for Dr. Farzan and Cheney for bringing your, your perspective as well on how to how to work with community and um, on the different uh, topics and Alejandro from the Desert Healthcare District perspective as well. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I didn't really get much time to talk about it, but the odor, um, I did want to mention that our group is planning to deploy an H2S sensor on the Salton Sea very soon. It's going to be on a um, platform out there and we want to have that as you know to address some of the data disparity it's going to be accessible to everybody uh, who wants to see it um but anyway yeah it was a great uh great talk here lots of important discussions came up and feel free to get a hold of me or anybody else um um about any of these topics michael did you have some final word yeah well, i just want to thank you ryan for moderating the panel and all the panelists for taking quite a bit of your time to uh, i think it's been a very interesting webinar raised a lot of interesting questions. Um, this whole idea of cumulative burden, uh, to me, I think maybe encouraging the state to rethink how it's addressing emissions from the Salton Sea and needs to start thinking more broadly about how to address these range of different impacts, not just from the Salton Sea, but uh, cultural fields, uh, sanctioned and unsanctioned burning. So that, I think it raises a lot of opportunities for, for addressing public health and I also specifically want to uh, recognize the integration here of uh, community needs and community identified um, uh, healthcare concerns along with the academic research. So I think this this mix here is really helping to elevate the, the questions and identify some potential solutions. Um, and it's also want to thank Luisa for interpreting this. It's, I think she's been talking for two hours nonstop. So kudos to, to Luisa for, for doing that. Um, I want to remind everyone that uh, this webinar has been recorded and we'll post it uh, as soon as possible up on the Pacific Institute website at packins.org slash videos. So stay tuned, hoping to have <clears throat> the next webinar on lithium sometime next month. Um, thank you all for your attention and for your time. And I will uh, send out an email to all registrants as to when the recordings are, are posted. Thanks all. Thanks everybody.